I grew up uh, in a small village in the Essex countryside, about 60 kilometers north of London. It was 1992, and I was 12 years old, and my dad cut out an article from a newspaper, and it said that that night you could see the planet Mars with the naked eye. Now, as a 12-year-old, I was absolutely amazed by this, very, very excited. So that night, as soon as it got dark, my dad and I went out into the garden to try and see it. I'll never forget the first sight that we saw when we looked up at the stars. I'd never really looked at the stars before, and it was absolutely beautiful. Thousands of stars, it seemed like, all different colors. So how are we going to know which one was Mars? Well, fortunately, this newspaper article included a handy map for us to look at, and it had the constellations on it, funny shapes in the stars with odd Latin names. But that didn't really help, because there was no real waypoint to go from. But we made a breakthrough quite soon, because my dad noticed something he recognized, and that was a group of seven bright stars in the shape of a saucepan. He called it the plow. And the two right-hand side stars of the plow point directly up to the North Pole star, Polaris, which lies directly above the North Pole of the Earth. And all the other stars rotate around it once per day. So we had a waypoint on the map that we could follow. And we followed the map across the arc of the sky. And finally, we saw a bright, glowing orange orb. It was unmistakable. And that was the planet Mars. It was absolutely beautiful, and I'll never forget that first time we looked up at Mars. It was a wonderful experience to have between a parent and a child. And I was reflecting back on this experience recently with my dad, and, and I said, Dad, how did you know about this group of seven bright stars called the Plow? And he revealed something I'd never known. I'd never spoken to him about it, but apparently he used to look at the stars with his dad, when he was young. And very sadly, I never knew my granddad. He died when I was a baby, but it was wonderful that we had this kind of cosmic connection, if you will. I got to know my granddad's love of astronomy through my father that was passed down through the generations. And furthermore, I guess, my, where did my granddad get that love from? Was it from his parents or his grandparents? So I was interested to know how far that cosmic thread was woven through our family's history. Because astronomy is all about history. It allows us to study our history, our past. In fact, it's a form of time travel, because by looking at the stars, we are literally looking back through time. Because all the information that we receive from space travels to us at the speed of light, the unbreakable cosmic speed limit, 300,000 kilometers per second. So when you look up at the sun, the light that you see now left the surface of the sun eight minutes ago. And when you look at the very nearest star to us, Proxima Centauri, we see the light today that left that star's surface 4.2 years ago. And when we look at the nearest galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, we see the light that's traveled to us for two million years through our universe. So when you look at Andromeda, you see it as it was when our ape-like ancestors, Homo habilis, were roaming the surface of the Earth. So it's a form of time travel, and we can experience that time travel in our very body, in ourselves, because the stars are literally in our DNA. Every atom of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen inside your genetic material, in your DNA, was synthesized billions of years ago inside a star in the Milky Way galaxy. So perhaps that's why when we look at a glorious night sky filled with stars, that we feel this kind of connection to it, this feeling that we're a part of it all and that it is a part of us. Now, we also experience this cosmic connection um, through our histories and stories. The names of the constellations, for example, in the Western world, were passed down from the ancient Greeks, from Mesopotamia, and also from the Roman Empire. So those stories are 2,000 years old. And if you think about it, the only reason why we can still learn those stories and still use those constellations 
is that because nothing really has changed in the past 2,000 years, otherwise we couldn't use these star names. So if you went to Rome tonight and sat on the hills above Rome, and you looked up at the night sky, you would see almost exactly the same view as Julius Caesar saw 2,000 years ago. So barely anything has changed. And by looking at the stars, we are sitting, we are walking with our ancestors and experiencing something fundamentally human with them. And astronomy doesn't just let us look back into our history. It allows us to look to our future too. So by scientifically studying the positions of the stars and how they move, we can see our future. We can see how, for example, the Southern Cross, the constellation on our Australian flag, will dissolve before our very eyes over the next 10,000 years. Because we and all the stars in the galaxy are orbiting the Milky Way once every 230 million years. So in the orbits, the positions of the stars change relative to one another. And so we watch their positions change slowly, inexorably throughout time. An important cultural symbol of today for us will be completely gone in 10,000 years. And that's not just the constellations that are changing, it's the entire Milky Way. And this is the current view of our Milky Way, a beautiful band of light, 200 billion stars stretching across the night sky. And it's punctuated by these wonderful dark bands of gas and clouds of dust which absorb the background starlight. And these have had meaning in cultures around the world. For example, the Gamilaroi people, they saw an emu in the sky. The Inca people of South America, they saw a llama. And the ancient Greeks, they saw the Milky Way as a road of stars, a road through the sky walked by the gods towards the palace of Zeus. So whatever cultural background you come from, you'll probably find that the Milky Way has a really important part in your history and in your background. But all of this is about to change because the gravitational forces between neighboring galaxies are incredibly strong. And as a result, we are hurtling towards our neighbor, the Andromeda Galaxy, at 400,000 kilometers per hour. And at that rate, in about 3.8 billion years, they will be colliding head on. And when that happens, the sky will look very, very different indeed. So this is our night sky in four billion years time. I call it spiral Armageddon. It's just gonna be incredible. So as the gravitational forces get stronger and stronger as the two galaxies come together, the spiral arms of both will be ripped asunder and wrapped around our sky like the tentacles of some giant cosmic octopus. And although the stars will pass through one another, they won't collide themselves. The gas in the spiral arms of the galaxy will collide, creating new stars some 100 times bigger and brighter than our sun. And they will burn furiously for tens of millions of years before exploding as supernovae filling our skies with light. It's an amazing future to look forward to. So what's going to happen to the Earth in all of this? What's going to happen to us? Well, there's two options. We could be hurled off into space by gravity, flying out into intergalactic space as more stars disappear behind us, and we're left floating into the darkness, not a star in the sky. Now, the other option is a bit more palatable. And that is that we migrate slowly towards the center of the new formed merged galaxy called Milk Dromeda. And we see a sky filled with a glowing core of half a trillion stars, shining so brightly, in fact, that we can barely see anything in the background, a sky full of stars. So whichever one of these two scenarios comes true, we are surely going to have a big treat in store for our night skies in the future. So I want to give you three things you can do today, tonight, to go away and get connected to the night sky, to get connected to your ancestral history through astronomy. The first one is very modern. Download an app. 
So get to know the stars. You don't need a map anymore. There are these wonderful apps, and they use augmented reality. So you hold your phone up to the sky at night, and you don't know what you're looking at. And this, the star app tells you exactly which constellation, which planet. You can even see the International Space Station. It's absolutely fantastic. And if you do want a zoomed in view of something in the universe, you don't need to buy an expensive telescope. You can just buy a pair of binoculars like these. So these cost you about 150 Australian dollars at the moment, and you pop them on to a tripod and look at Jupiter. Jupiter is incredible through binoculars like this. You can see four tiny little points of light next to Jupiter, and these are its moons, which were discovered by Galileo in 1610. And I find it amazing that you can see Io, the most volcanic body in the solar system, Europa, a frozen moon that could well contain life, Ganymede, the biggest moon in our solar system, almost as big as Mercury, and Callisto, the most cratered body that's been bombarded by asteroids and meteorites for millennia. And all this for $150. If you do want to look for a telescope, get down to your local astronomical society or star party or public viewing night at an observatory. It's a wonderful place to look through big telescopes and just see some incredible sights, star clusters, nebulae, planets. It's an other world out there. And if you do want to buy a telescope for yourself, something like this will cost you about $500. It won't break the bank too badly. So I want you to imagine that you are sitting around a campfire. And next to you sits one of your ancestors from 1,000, 2,000 years ago. And they sit down next to you, and you, you don't recognize much of them. Perhaps you don't speak the same language. Perhaps you don't have the same dialects or culture or clothes or food or beliefs. But you will have something fundamentally in common with that person because you will have your history through the stars. It will be in your DNA. It will be in your heart and your culture and your ideas. And you'll be able to share that with your ancestors. So please get to know the stars. I want to finish on a wonderful quote by the late author, Kate Bartolotta. And I think she nailed it when she said this. Look at the stars. It won't fix the economy. It won't stop wars. It won't give you flat abs or even help you figure out your relationship. But it's important because it helps you to remember that you and your problems are both infinitesimally small and conversely, that you are a part of this amazing and vast universe. Thank you.